Hey everyone, welcome to our third episode of After the Breach podcast. We're your hosts, Jeff Friedman and Sarah Shimazu, and we're excited to welcome our guest to the show, Captain and Professional Guide, David Havey. He's worked with us here in the Pacific Northwest and also been in Alaska, Antarctica, the Canadian Arctic, and more. We'll be chatting with him about his experiences in wild places and his new project, a documentary called Samnesia. We hope you enjoy it, and we can't wait to bring you even more whale-filled episodes from here on out. So, David, welcome to the show. Welcome to the show, David. Thank you. First time I've ever been on a podcast, so this is exciting and interesting. It's our third time being on a podcast. It is oh, our maybe third our time. fourth time, and it's a late night recording session. Uh, it is. You know, when you live on an island uh, and you're old, nine o'clock <laughs> is 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 late <laughs> on a Saturday night. And here you could have said we were like recording at one a.m., Jeff, and you outed us at <laughs> being. 9 p.m. 9 p.m. Night owls. <laughs> well, we were we were all out on the water water today, so we were, and there were some cool things going on. But we'll talk about that. We will. We'll talk a about bit lots of latest sightings, updates to talk about uh, with everybody. Uh, but yeah, let's let's kick things off and and Dave, and tell us a little bit about yourself and and your background and and what you're doing here. Well. Uh, Pretty tough, broad question to answer succinctly, but um, been a captain in the San Juan Islands for Maya's legacy for the last five years, and prior to that, had a variety of experiences in wild places, and uh, kind of keeping the the goal in mind of education and outreach, sharing whatever I was learning in wild places with as many people as I could, from whatever backgrounds that they might be coming from. Uh, It's pretty easy to talk to people who are already interested in wildlife, wild places, have a little bit of knowledge about those things. But my goal has always been to try to connect with whoever else um, might not even suspect that they are open to hearing about such things and and thinking about them and reflecting on how they apply to their own personal lives. And so I started as a brown bear coastal brown bear, also the same species as, gri- species as grizzly bear, field technician in Alaska where I lived in a field camp for, gosh, the better part of five years. So wow. myself and three other staff on an island that was about a million acres in Alaska. So that was an entire novel worth of information I could talk about uh, happily. But we'll just end it there. A lot of good times there. Learned a lot. Uh, from there, did some field work doing a ecosystem inventory on a floodplain on the Angola-Zambia border, basically just like trying to understand what animals were even there and in what densities and in what dynamics they were interacting. And um, went back to Alaska, had a little bit better understanding of salmon, better understanding of ecology and ecosystem dynamics and uh, left my brown bear job and worked for a basically a sam wild salmon advocacy and defense organization in alaska for about five years there as well and learned a lot about how to communicate about not just salmon but why they're relevant to our lives or why clean water or why wild places are relevant to our lives and that was a lot of time in an office a lot of time behind emails. It was a seven day a week job, probably 10 to 12 hours a day. And I just needed to be away from the computer for a bit and back out in wild places. And so ended up taking a job that was a very weird kind of demand for skills, which were know about bears, know how to handle firearms and know how to operate boats in terrible conditions. And so that led to a job leading people by boat to see polar bears in the Arctic, which... Yeah, translated into uh, driving boats in Antarctica, um, where I was really, really introduced to, I guess, how interesting and mysterious the lives of whales are. And uh, if it wasn't for that, I probably wouldn't be here on San Juan Island if I had not gone to Antarctica and just been exposed to whales there. So kind of a weird, twisting, long journey. And uh, here I am for the last five years and hopefully for a lot more to come. So, uh, um, so Alaska led 
you to Antarctica to the San Juan Islands, which is which is probably a pretty typical route for. <laughs> yeah, it's super. I, I it was a blueprint that I followed. Really, <laughs> I I just I, I'm stuck on one thing. I have to ask about it: the firearms. Sure. What, what? What? Go ahead. Shoot. What? What was that for on those, those uh, expeditions? Well, in Alaska, for the agency that I worked for, it was mandatory to carry one when operating in brown bear country. And so if we were brown bear field technicians, we were operating in brown bear country. Um, but I never had to use one, never even had to load one around brown bears, but it was just required to carry one. And if you're carrying one, you should probably be pretty confident with it. Yep. Um, Sounds like a good idea. Right. And so we trained a lot, um, very familiar with them. And the job that I was offered in the Arctic, with, with, this was in uh, Greenland, northeast Greenland. Um, it required you to be able to know how to handle a boat in pretty dynamic conditions, how to talk with people, and uh, enough familiarity around bears and firearms to basically know that you don't have to use them if you see a bear. Um, so I've never once had to even put a round in the chamber of a firearm around a bear, but know how to handle them safely know how to not panic and, you know, kind of see a bear and think, oh, my God, we're all going to die. We should shoot this thing. Like, of course <laughs> not. Uh, and so I think that was probably what they were seeking out of a firearm bear up north, if that makes sense. It, it, uh, I just I had to ask. It, it just kind of stuck out when you were when you were talking about it. Um, but you, yeah, you, so now currently you're, you're with us in the San Juan Islands and you're also part of the year, uh, working in a, Antarctica. Yeah, I think this is, if I do the math right, I think this would be year seven coming up in, Antar in Antarctica. And, uh, when I started, I was working full seasons down there from October to March. And, uh, I think you guys have heard this story plenty of times, but Spent five years in a field camp in Alaska with not a lot of humans nearby and a lot of bears and was kind of ticking by the years that I hadn't gone on a single date in my mid twenties. And I was, I was remembering all these really cool guys that lived out in the forest in Alaska that had like these extensive libraries and could talk about everything and had a couple dogs and knew how to do a bunch of stuff, but, uh, they'd been living that life for 30 or 40 years. And I, I thought that's the guy you want to know, but that's not the guy you want to be. And uh, so I decided, yeah, I'll leave. I'll go to Antarctica, see if I can find anybody <laughs> down there. <laughs> and when you struck out there, you decided yeah. San Juan Island was the place to come. <laughs> <'cause> <laughs> we're just Indeed. Yeah. Came here and actually, but you actually did, but you actually did. Actually met somebody here, which I mean, great. That wasn't necessarily like the motivating factor to move here. Um, but that's just a nice little way to wrap that, uh, that story up. I we all love, we love Olivia. Absolutely. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, you took this amazing route from Alaska to Antarctica to San Juan Island. As Jeff said, Jeff took the direct Cleveland to Seattle to San Juan Island route. Um, but we're all here. So that's uh, exciting. But you, you know, while you were down in Antarctica, the last couple of, times um <laughs> sent me some pretty crazy photos you had some pretty amazing encounters down there so um are there any that like stick out at the forefront of your mind when someone says hey david tell me about a really cool encounter you had in antarctica yeah there's two i don't know if we have enough time for both and i should circle back to that question i i formerly worked october to march in in antarctica and that that was so much time away from just people and interaction with any kind of social life that I've shortened that to just January and February, because those are the two months that if anybody's listening that wants to go to Antarctica, those would be the months to go if you're interested in whales, because I'm not kidding. If you cruise through certain areas in Antarctica in late January, early February, if you look in any direction, you're going to see numerous whales. And that's kind of why I've shortened my season to those two months because that gives me the best opportunity to do kind of what I love to do and um, experience and encounter the things that I'm, I'm most interested in. Not to say that glaciers and sea ice and penguins aren't interesting, but those are the species that I'm really drawn to down there. Um, and two interactions or two encounters. Uh, the first, well, I don't know. I'm not necessarily listing them in order of... Uh, 
occur. Wow factor. It's, a, it's okay. Oh, okay. It's, it's, this isn't a formal this requirement. Is a, this is a very formal uh, categorization of best <laughs> to worst, starting with number one and ending with number two. Um, but one of them, we were in the South Scotia Sea, which is about, oh, I don't know, a couple hundred miles northeast of the Antarctic Peninsula. And I'm sure a lot of people that are listening have heard of these massive tabular icebergs calving off of the Larsen Ice Shelf. And some of them are like the size of Jamaica or Belgium, these just gigantic, wow. gigantic icebergs. It's hard to imagine. And we veered the ship off course to see if we could find this thing. We had some satellite imagery and some rough ideas of where we might find it. And uh, sure enough, we found this tabular iceberg that I think at that time was roughly the size of Jamaica, which is pretty impressive. And as we were approaching, we started to see more and more whales, some southern right whales, some blue whales. And as we got to within maybe a half a mile or so, there were just, I mean, more than we could count. Um, I'm not sure exactly what was going on. There were some theories at the time, and I haven't even really gone back to check if this is accurate or not. But what we were talking about, or what, what some of my colleagues were talking about, is maybe there's some interaction with that melting fresh water that influences the movement of krill around that iceberg that makes them a little bit easier to catch for whales. And uh, I think we kind of loosely just guessed that we'd seen 500 whales in wow. half a day. <laughs> Holy cow. And, and were these all baleen whales, like humpbacks? <laughs> there were, so blue whales, southern rights, minkies, fins, even a couple says. Wow. Which aren't Dude. really... <laughs> You know, we don't see those very often, but we saw a few there that day. And, I mean, so many humpback whales. And then with all that, I guess, available food, uh, there were a couple type A killer whales just kind of cruising around as well. Just maybe we didn't see any predation events, but they were, I'm sure, very aware that there was a lot to eat there and were interested in being in the area, you know, if they wanted to take advantage. And then the second... One question: When sure. when you're going through something like that, are, like are you taking people out in in the zodiac? Like, what are you doing? What's your role in 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 this? That day, it was it was, I mean, blue water is open, o- like big, big open ocean, and we found some protection from the iceberg, kind of in the lee from those oceanic waves and the wind and everything. And we probably could have and probably should have lowered our smaller boats are smaller like 18 to 22 foot zodiacs into the water for a little bit more intimate experience but i think everybody was just so like blown away that we were just happy viewing them from our larger ship which is depending on which one we go on oh i don't know maybe 250 to 280 feet so roughly the size of a washington state ferry and uh i don't even really think we thought about dropping the zodiacs into the water to experience that from the water level because we were all just like, I mean, we'd never experienced anything like that before. And we were all just happy with what we had in the moment. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. It sounds incredible. And can I yeah. interrupt one more time? Cause some of our listeners probably don't know that there are different types of killer whales in Antarctica really quick. Would you just kind of give us a, a short rundown of some of the, the types, like you say type a, what, what is that? Right. So the, yeah. Them? So these are different. Like we don't see those killer whales up here. Absolutely. We have totally not, yeah. different population yeah yeah what are the what are the populations you you might see down in antarctica yeah happy to um we uh we most commonly see uh, a type of killer whale that is frequently hunting penguins and they've got a few different names some people call them type b small some people call them type b2 some people call them girlash killer whales um but they're they're interesting they do have a little bit of a physiological distinction that makes them easy to identify they're they're a little bit smaller than the killer whales we have around here and algae colonizes their bodies it's called diatomaceous growth diatoms are colonizing their bodies and it gives them a little bit of like a greenish yellow tint to their body so it's like a you know dichotomous black and white killer whale with this kind of yellowish green tint to them and i was talking with some biologists from NOAA actually who spent a little bit of time down there and they said they've they're pretty confident that those whales occasionally are leaving Antarctica, heading straight for some location off the coast of Brazil to exfoliate and rub those diatoms off their body, and then they'll come straight back to Antarctica. And I think that process, I'm not sure exactly, might take three weeks or so for that to happen. 
So like a three week spa vacation. Yes, nice. Brazil. Nice. Good choice. And uh, those are the type that we see most frequently. The type B one or the the type B large killer whales um, are the ones that maybe people have seen in the the BBC documentaries. Um, cruising around in the pack ice, spy hopping around the pack ice to locate seals and then kind of working cooperatively to create pressure waves to knock seals off icebergs. We see those a few times a year, whereas we see the type B2 or the Gerlash killer whales um, probably once every few days. So we're wow. seeing those guys a lot. The type A's are, um, I'm not sure if we know the full suite of things that they're hunting, but they definitely target other species of whales fairly regularly. And uh, they're a little bit larger. Um, some people kind of equate them to the Southern Hemisphere, the Antarctic bigs population. And then there's a type C, and we never see them because they, they live, as far as we know, almost exclusively on the exact opposite side of Antarctica near the Ross Sea, and they're hunting fish for the most part. And then there's a type D killer whale that, to this point, I don't know how many confirmed sightings there have been, but I think less than 40 total. Yeah, I don't, yeah, just. And they're more of an open ocean whale. They're often seen, and when I say often, I mean like once a year, um, maybe a couple times a year, but between uh, South America and Antarctica, usually by like fishing vessels or one of my friends who lives in Euclid in British Columbia has seen them like four times. Wow. Because she's always on the outer decks of our ship that are traveling from South America to Antarctica. And she's just always, always, always out there looking. And the more time you spend out there looking with your binoculars, just looking around, time invested to just see what you can see, the more you're going to see. And I don't know how many times those animals have been confirmed to have been seen. I, I'm guessing, I mean, easily less than 100 times total, but I think a lot lower than that, maybe less than 40 or 50 and one of my friends has seen them like three or four times. So uh, if you don't know what those are, look them up on the internet. Type D killer whales. They've got a very, very distinct look to them. Kind of a blocky melon, a blocky rostrum, and a really small eye patch. Yeah, and they're really swept back dorsal fins too. Yeah. And we can post some links to some info on the type Ds and other Antarctic uh, yeah. killer whales in the show notes. Yeah, um, definitely. And then I want to hear about your second uh, encounter but I, I also think you, you got me sold. I think we need to do a podcast from Antarctica. <laughs> from Antarctica. Oh, yeah. I'm in. I'm, in. I'm all shot. in on this. We, I think really we really need to go down there and, and see it firsthand and, sure. and do a podcast about yeah, the, this. Yeah, the Wi-Fi is great down there. <laughs> <laughs> so your second, the, you said there were two. Yeah, the second one, um, I don't know how detailed I want to get into how we found these whales, but we found them. Um, a friend of ours found them. He was actually... Um, one of our ornithologists, and he was up on top of a mountain, just kind of really, s he's, he's a jack of all trades, knows a lot about a lot of things, and he was kind of assessing crevasse, um, potential crevasse danger in an area that we were going to be just kind of walking around on for the day, um, trying to find some chin strap penguins, and he, being just a generally aware person looking around at all times at what's going around or going on around him, was just taking a, a few moments here and there to just scan the water off in the distance with his binoculars, and he found um, like five miles away a group of killer whales, and he, he let us know we were all on the water in our smaller boats, and I wasn't actually um, in a boat with any guests on that occasion. I was actually responsible for training a new Zodiac driver, and a Zodiac is a, just a small uh, like 18-foot boat with a single engine on it, really perfect for... Uh, you know, dynamic conditions, landing on beaches, you know, moving around through sea ice, that kind of stuff. And I was responsible for teaching or training a new staff member how to drive that. And uh, so we weren't anywhere near those killer whales. And I looked at her and I said, this, this could be a once in a lifetime thing. Like, do you want to work on a couple skills or do you want to go, you know, see, see what we can find if we go over and look for those killer whales. And I think we, like, if we were being, super responsible we probably should have worked on those skills but we chose not to and we went over to where those killer whales were at and um we generally have kind of two uh i don't know what you'd call them waves not really waves just two kind of hour-long cruises in our zodiacs uh every morning and every afternoon and there's a little bit of a gap between those two 
because all the zodiacs have to return to where the guests are and drop some people off, maybe on shore at a penguin colony, maybe back at the vessel, and then pick up the next round of people that have not yet been on that zodiac cruise. And so there was a gap of about 45 minutes. Um, and we wanted to make sure that as many people as possible could see those killer whales. And as anyone who's been around them knows, they can move great distances very quickly. And in and around icebergs and little islands and sea ice, it could be quite easy to lose sight of those whales. And so I very selflessly volunteered <laughs> to stay with those killer whales to make sure that the, the next round of Zodiacs could also see them. And uh, so we were basically there by ourselves for close to an hour with, I think, what turned out being 35 to 40 Gerlash killer whales. And uh, wow, they were very curious in us as well as some of the other boats. And when we were alone with them, um, some of the some of the adult females would kind of swim by us and you could actually see, they were swimming so close you could see their eyes inspecting wow. us visually wow and then they'd kind of come up within a couple feet I actually have a photo that I didn't mean to have taken but uh, I was just leaning over the zodiac just kind of looking at this um, killer whale and she just barely came up to the surface and her rostrum was maybe I don't know three feet from my face and I backed away really quickly I don't know what was going to happen i'm sure nothing would have but didn't want to take any chances of course and there is a photo of the brim of my hat about two feet away from that the well's face wow amazing. but after they did that then uh, they'd come back with a couple more killer whales and some calves some really young calves almost like they were um introducing their calves to this new object and then after a little while they all kind of formed a line and just kind of very slowly I mean, I'm talking three dozen killer whales, like a line shoulder to shoulder, effectively, just kind of swam right at us and then right underneath the Zodiac and, and continued to the other side. And they stuck around for quite a while. Every time my radio, my VHF radio had any kind of like feedback or transmission on it, um, there was one whale that was hanging around the boat. And at the end of every transmission, there's just a little bit of like a, um, a squelch or a feedback that just goes like... And uh, every time that happened, she would try to mimic that sound somehow. <laughs> wow. And so I don't know if she was like, oh, let's make first contact with this. <laughs> I, they, they could be intelligent. Maybe we can see if we can talk to them. Or if, you know, like when you're walking around a pond and you hear a duck and you're like, ah, stupid duck, quack, quack. Like if they were making fun of us <laughs> That's or if they were trying to communicate or who knows, maybe nothing else. But uh, it was it was it was really interesting. And then. Some people might have seen a video on YouTube from this exact day of uh, a penguin kind of swimming very frightfully away from a group of killer whales and jumping into a small zodiac. Okay. And uh, I've seen the that. killer whales. Yeah. Swim- that was that exact day. That's, oh, that's I didn't that know happened. that. That's yeah. amazing. Well, wow. maybe we can uh, find that video and post it on our show notes. And would love to, if you still have that photo, would love to. Yeah, sure. It's uh, an iPhone it. photo, so it's a That's high, okay. high quality photo. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean that that is mind blowing. That whole description of that in, that encounter. Yeah. yeah, that I mean that I don't think I'll ever have that again. So that was one of those once in a lifetime, I think, chances to have that happen. And I, I think, in all honesty, it's a good thing that we skipped those skills that day and, yeah. and had that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it's uh, it, it just sounds incredible and. Their, their curiosity and I, yeah I would assume that they don't see humans or or boats very often in their their day to day so we're definitely pretty uh, a, a pretty novel thing to them kind of like the Bremer killer whales well, Bremer very Canyon very much whales. like the Bremer killer whales and okay. and very different from the killer whales here where you know they they know who we are they know what we're doing and they're they're just we're really a fly on the wall and there's not really the that kind of interaction yeah really i mean to add on to that we were just kind of drifting around in a open pocket of water you know probably the nearest sea ice to us was i don't know half a mile away so we were felt really really comfortable just turning our engines totally off and just sitting there and just kind of watching and we kind of suspected or expected to have to keep an eye on them through binoculars at some point and try to have to navigate in any openings in the sea ice to kind of figure out where they were headed and how we would be able to retain like a, 
visual contact with them to help the rest of our guests see them. And we shut our engines off and uh, they stayed with us. Like they weren't staying generally in the area. They, we were the feature and they were staying with us. That is absolutely incredible. Yeah. You really can't doubt like their intelligence and, and what wanting to like interact, like make contact. And I think I, I say this on the boats too. It's like, you know, when a deer sees a, a car, they just, Think of the car as the creature, and when I think I really feel like when killer whales are around boats, like they recognize that there are people on boats. Like yeah, that I mean that that encounter, I think really solidified that for me because it was obvious that they were interested in the boat to some degree, and were you know doing a few passes to get a good look at that, but they were looking at us like they right. they were making sure that they were positioning themselves to be able to see what we were and what yeah. we were up to. And I should note, I, I'm sure a lot of people listening to this already know, and Sarah and Jeff can expand on this, but it's not really something that you need to worry about wild killer whales attacking humans and dragging them off to sea and consuming them. I don't re- I'm not really aware of any incidents of that ever happening. Yeah, um, never. And these types are, you know, they're primarily eating penguins. And so we weren't being like highly irresponsible and tempting these wild predators to take a bite. And that's not how that interaction played out at all, nor how really any of your encounters with wild killer whales would play out. No, and and I've I've been in the water with them in, in Norway. And at no point do you ever feel like they're checking you out because you might be tasty. (laughs) Um, so you spent a lot of time down there and then you've been up here, um, you know, for, for years. And, and I know talking with you over the past years, you've gotten, you've tied into your past work with salmon and have wanted to really take things to a, a new level out here with uh, re- salmon recovery efforts and education. And this ties directly into the endangered Southern resident killer whales that we see here uh, that feed uh, predominantly on salmon uh, and the decline of salmon is why the, that population is in, endangered, unlike the, the marine mammal eating bigs, killer whales. And you, you've you come a, 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 across a project that you've started and I uh, would love to hear a little bit about, uh, about your film project that you're working on. Yeah, so I, I should give a, a little bit more of a background, I suppose, um, as to why I am passionate about this. And I think if I'm being fully honest, um, wild salmon are really what my primary passion is, even though I'm spending a very large amount of my year around whales every year. Um, And it started when I was in Alaska, and I was there basically to um, help manage a, a small little sanctuary where Uh, wild brown bears have become familiar enough with human presence in small quantities, you know, just like 12 people at a time total. Um, But familiar enough with humans around that they just carry on with their daily activity, foraging for clams in the tide flats, uh, eating sedge in the spring in the estuaries, and then when the salmon begin to run, obviously hunting salmon. And uh, so I was helping to manage that area as kind of a, a dual role as a ranger as well as a field technician and then uh, part of our our duty there was also to uh, help better understand home ranges for adult female brown bears and adult male brown bears on coastal islands in Alaska and uh, so we had a full plate and plenty of time also to just kind of at the end of the day just relax and you know go for a hike in in the wilderness or go kayaking or um, read a book or just kind of study something that you've been curious about, whatever that was, because we had no internet, we had no cell phone, we had really no access to the bigger, broader world. So you were basically just there. And uh, you could bring plenty of books to the island, as many as you really wanted to. And so there was, it was basically just an outdoor classroom, and the land and the water was the teacher for the teachers. And uh, fairly quickly I realized out there that the salmon were really what was tying everything together. I was there to be around the bears to help manage the sanctuary, to help kind of study their home ranges. But it was very obvious that 
salmon were the reason that there were bears there. And they were the reason that there were all these birds, some mustelid species, mink and marten. They were the reason that seals and sea lions were kind of coming into that zone every, you know, July and August. Um, we'd see huge schools of juvenile salmon and humpback whales foraging on them. Um, you'd see all the bodies of salmon that had moved up river and then either laid their eggs or fertilized eggs that had been laid and then their bodies shut down and they become food for the entire ecosystem. Many of those carcasses were being eaten by, you know, invertebrates and insects and all kinds of cool stuff. A lot were flushing downstream and getting consumed by crabs at the river delta. Um, Bears and weasels and birds were taking some of those salmon carcasses into the forest and consuming as much as they could, but some of that obviously was going to leach into the soil and help fertilize the plant life. And so it became really obvious to me that salmon were like really the the glue holding the whole story together. Like people go to Alaska to see wildlife without those wild populations of salmon. You're probably not going to see the things you went up there to see in any sort of prolific numbers. And uh, so I ended up leaving that job to work for a wild salmon defense an advocacy organization because I was really aware of what had happened in the Salish Sea area, you know, around Seattle, around Vancouver, around Victoria to their wild salmon populations, what they were a hundred years ago or less and what they are presently. And then I started to become a little bit more aware of the Columbia and the Snake River system. And then I became aware of like the San Joaquin and Sacramento rivers around the San Francisco Bay and how those used to be mind boggling bogglingly prolific salmon rivers as well and I wanted to make sure at least in Alaska that the same fate that the rest of the west coast suffered wouldn't happen in Alaska also and spent a lot of years doing that and uh, when I came down here and started to learn more and more about southern resident killer whales and uh, kind of the the lives they've had to lead for the last decade or so or maybe a little bit more if we're being honest about that um made me think, well, yeah, I want to simultaneously help keep Alaskan salmon wild as much as I can so they don't disappear like the ones have down here. And then if there's any opportunities to help people remember or become maybe introduced for the first time to the reality of how densely populated this region was with salmon just like two human generations ago and help maybe shift, I don't know, maybe just kind of encourage a conversation to help us reassess what our priorities are, really, um, that maybe there can be some opportunities for restoration. We've, we're already seeing that on the Elwha River on the Olympic Peninsula, and uh, there could be more opportunities for stuff like that to happen. Um, and so I thought, well, there's been a lot of salmon documentaries that have been made. Many of them are just tied to like one specific river, one specific piece of legislation, one piece of action that the filmmakers are trying to help people uh, engage on. Um, But there haven't been very many full history documentaries of West Coast wild salmon, uh, where they used to live, where they still live, what their populations are, what they were, what are the reasons for some of the declines, what are the reasons for why some of those populations remain healthy, um, what opportunities there are for restoration and then tie that into like why that's important to us at the individual and collective level um and i could go on and on and on like about the philosophy of this and our our goal to help maybe introduce people to like philosophical questions about why it's important to have a relationship with a wild river or a productive biodiverse planet um if you guys are interested in that conversation but i think i've introduced it enough. If you have any more questions about it, I'm happy to talk about it, but I think that was a pretty robust monologue there. Well, I, th- I think you're hitting something, I think, that that w- will run deep with a lot of people because coming out here eight years ago, like I don't know this region as a prolific salmon region. Um, I know it's you hear about it, at, but it's all historical. I've heard stories about off the west side of San Juan Island, between San Juan Island and and Vancouver Island, uh, back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, you know, hundreds of purse seeners uh, catching salmon. And now, uh, all, all summer long, and now if you see 
half a dozen of them out there for a week, it's like, wow, there's so much fishing going on. And right. Yeah. I, like I have no, I have no, and I think this is true for a lot of people, not just in the San Juan Islands, but all up and down the West Coast, is there, there's, there's no connection to the history of what this really was like back when we had a, an abundant salmon population uh, going. So I think, I think you're striking a, a really interesting angle on this. Well, yeah. So the concept um, of the whole, the, the whole thing that motivated us to do this was a really good friend of mine. She's French Canadian and I met her in Arctic Canada and we were talking about, you know, a variety of things. And she introduced me to this concept or topic called generational amnesia. And uh, that's loosely defined as um, basically every generation um, begins to assume that the condition conditions into which they are born are normal. And so without any reference points to anything that happened decades ago or any reference points to what is still happening in areas that are still wildly productive with life, um, there's, there's really no um, reason or... or conduit for people to understand what once was and so then you just begin to think okay what's going on here now is the way it's always been and it's the way it always will be and uh, the concept of that is basically like we don't even know what we've forgotten G- generally obviously there are a lot of people that do but kind of generally just like you were referring to when you see a couple pink salmon jumping around here like two or three and you hear people exclaiming, like, the salmon are back. This is great. Here they are. And when I hear that, I'm just thinking, like, man, if you could just see what it is in healthy rivers and around healthy estuaries when it's, I mean, it looks like popcorn, just fish jumping everywhere. And you go into the stream and there's not, like, a cubic inch of vacant water for anything other than, like, another salmon body trying to occupy that space because there's thousands and thousands of them. And that's happening like along the entire Alaskan coast and parts of British Columbia still. And it used to look like that all the way down to San Francisco Bay um, not long ago. And that's where this generational amnesia concept comes into play is like people don't, I don't, I mean, maybe some do. I'm, I'm not necessarily saying that nobody knows or, you know, discrediting anybody's awareness of our ecological history here. But I think generally, if you ask people, what this place um, was like, they might know, they might not. Um, if they see somebody filleting a fish on the dock, which is probably a hatchery reared fish, they might think, see, this is a great place to catch salmon, still is, always was. And they don't really have those reference points of what this place, I mean, like you mentioned it, people just casting their nets off the west side of San Juan Island and pulling them in filled with salmon, like, in the seventies, that's not long ago. Think about what it was at the turn of the century around 1900. And, uh, there's another concept. Sorry to carry on here. This is is great stuff. Yeah. Sorry to carry on here, but like a lot of wildlife biologists and ichthyologists refer to this concept of shifting baselines. And a baseline is basically the data set that you have at the beginning of a study that every subsequent year you're referencing back to that data set to understand, you know, any changes over time. And the shifting baselines concept is that that's not necessarily an accurate representation of what the original baseline was. And then maybe that baseline is shifting from year to year or decade to decade. And then studies are really only, only analyzing year to year and referencing the previous year's data or maybe five year data um, and then saying, oh, well, we've, we've seen a slight increase or a slight decrease, but that really only represents like fractions of the original populations. And so is the goal to like restore all wild salmon rivers to their former glory on the West Coast? I think that's probably not realistic, of course. But as much as we can, as much awareness as we can raise as to what this place used to be and uh, maybe identify some priority rivers and streams and watersheds where that could be realistic. And then maybe help people understand that, like, you know, this is going to be a little bit heavy here at, at, at coming up here. But, like, if you just look out at the horizon right now at the world, really, it's 
there's some dark storms out there. If you think about biodiversity, you think about climate change, think what's going on politically, domestically, internationally, supply chains, um, democracy, like anything that you really look out at right now, just like, man, this is a heavy, heavy time to be alive. And I know for sure a lot of people are thinking, you know what, if I had a million bucks, I just move to the forest where there's a nice productive source of clean water and a lot of wild salmon that I could eat. You know, like obviously that's the daydream for a lot of people. And uh, wouldn't that be nice? Like obviously we're not going to get back there, but obviously that's something that intrinsically a lot of people wish we still had. And uh, if we don't even know how we lost it, how are we going to start thinking about how we might prioritize areas where we can help restore here and there, if that makes any sense. Yeah, absolutely. I think it definitely does. Sorry to sorry to talk about something heavy, but that's no. that's no, the this is this is why you're on the do this it, is right? why you're on the podcast. Um one one quick note, you did mention one of the success stories with the Elwa River. Um and we should post some links to some information uh for our listeners about uh what has happened on the Elwa River in Washington yeah. State with the they've removed some dams and that river is once again a wild river that is raging back. Yeah. And really, really successful. Yeah, yeah. Just a, a quick overview. The Elwha River is lo- located on the Olympic Peninsula out near Port Angeles uh, is where the river exits into the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Um, it was uh, dammed um, illegally, if I remember correctly, um, you know, back in the early 1900s. And after a very long legal battle, uh, the dams were removed uh, in 2012 and 2014, the two dams that were on there. And I think what they said when the dams um, came down is that they expected salmon um, to reach the upper reaches of the Elwha in the in 20 years. Like that was kind of their their thought was like it would take 20 years for them to get back up to the upper reaches of the Elwha. And I'm and and I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was within a year they were back up above the second dam site. Um, and we've had increasing numbers of Chinook and other salmon. Yeah, and, every year. And some decent size Chinook. Yeah. Like some yeah. big Chinook. And it's played an imp- it's it's really impacted um the ecological balance there and like what they're seeing with uh sediment flow and like the the you know spit at Port Angeles. They're not having to truck in um sand and, and other uh soil to keep that there cuz the river's running free again. So um, Coastal Watershed Institute, actually, I follow them on Facebook, and um, their page is really awesome. They do a lot of surveys in the lower reaches of the Elwha, looking at s- what species are there. But really cool, um, really cool thing that happened there. Largest dam removal project in the U.S., if I remember correctly. Uh, yes, so and far. So, so far. So far. So far. One uh, of the cool things that I think is a, a great takeaway from this and, and kind of builds on what you're trying to create with with your your project is we're really fortunate salmon they don't need a lot they're going to do the heavy lifting if we just create the wild conditions right for, for them to come back there's not a lot we need to do right and uh and what those conditions are are basically just consistency they need to be able to know where they were born remember where they were born what little tributary stream or what you know, gravel bed or, you know, in some species cases, what uh, wetland or what lake they were born in, and they need to be able to remember that. And it's basically like a molecular or a chemical kind of uh, GPS that will help them navigate downstream. They're remembering each twist and turn, every kind of pH level, every kind of element of that river's chemistry to help them return to that. And if those conditions are changing year to year, it's not easy for those exact populations to return and repopulate. And so what they need is that wild um, consistency, really. It needs to kind of just remain fairly stable so they can come back and forth year after year after year after year. So well, and, and they need a river. Yeah, yeah. They there need, you go. They need, they need you know, not river a, without dams. Not a terminal hatchery, yeah. Um, yeah. And so one more thing, I, I kind of got going on that um, horizon thing without really fully under or explaining what I, m- what I meant by that is, uh, you know, if anybody, I think if you really talk to anybody right now, there's an elephant in the room that if you look at at the horizon, uh, there's some, there's some storms out there and we want to feel hopeful. That's kind of our human nature to feel hopeful. 
And so this project we're working on isn't necessarily to write a prescription on exactly how we can help recover all salmon populations and return things to their formal, former glory. Rather, it is kind of this joint sense of realism and idealism. You, like, if you want to be hopeful, if you want to be an idealist, if you want to have a vision, you need to understand where you're standing and you need to understand how you got there. Because if you want to have a vision and then execute that vision and chart a path into this kind of wild horizon that we're facing, you can't really do it if you don't even know how you got to where you're standing. And so that's kind of the point of this project is to just not a doomsday story of what happened to wild salmon, but just help people understand like, okay, this is where it was. Here's where we are now. And if we want to have a vision for what we want our West Coast to look like, whether it's with salmon and herring or, or whatever we want it to look like, then we should certainly get real about that vision, be idealistic and hopeful about it. But y it's going to be more probable to execute that vision, to carry it forward into kind of uncertain future if you at least understand your own history or the West Coast's history, if that makes sense. Yeah. It, it does. I and Without that historic knowledge and understanding what salmon abundance actually looks like, it it it's all kind of in a vacuum. Like you don't really know what you're trying to do without knowing where where things stood before. Right. And so, one last thing about that, unless we want to carry on with with details of it, but our goal is to um, w when we started this, I just started reaching out to a couple friends here and there in Alaska, Northern British Columbia. Haida Gwaii, Vancouver Island, and there are so many people that want to contribute to this, like on a volunteer basis in any way they can, spreading the word, helping us with underwater video footage, helping us with footage in areas that we might not be able to access on our own. But the idea is to show basically what a watershed is from headwaters to river to estuary to sea um, and help people understand that interconnection between marine, estuarine, and freshwater habitats. Uh, and then also show what healthy rivers and healthy watersheds look like when they're running rich with salmon, just to help people actually see that and see that it's not just in one national park that's featured over and over in nature documentaries, but it's like 5,000 catalog cataloged rivers and streams by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Like thousands of these rivers look like this for a few weeks or a few months every year. And then move down the coast and kind of see that taper off a little bit and get all the way down to San Francisco Bay where they used to also have millions of salmon every year. And I don't think they really have any anymore. And then just kind of help give that gradient and help people see what it looks like where they might live and see what it can look like and what it presently does look like in places farther north and help people understand that those conditions aren't just unique to Alaska because Alaska is this amazing Shangri-La where life is prolific. Uh, it's just really the one of the, the few places on this continent, especially on the West Coast, uh, that looks like it used to look like. And, you're, and you are hoping to do this all through film, correct? Cor well, yeah, I mean, hopefully one full feature documentary and then a series of accompanying short videos that each kind of emphasize or highlight one point that individually that point might come across and think, okay, that makes sense. And then over the course of time, if you've seen all of those like eight to 10 short videos that kind of weave a fabric together, you start to understand like conceptually the bigger ecosystem dynamics and why salmon are important, not just to salmon, why they're not important, not just important to fishermen, but important to other species like southern resident killer whales. Uh, brown bears, coastal wolves, seals, sea lions, seabirds, even humpback whales that uh, will take advantage of juvenile salmon. Um, many, many, many communities. Uh, I mean, spiritual relationship with life and death. I mean, that's the entry point for a lot of cultures on the West Coast, observing that sacrifice of one's life for the next generation through the salmon spawn and has helped many people kind of relate to that you know, kind of scary um, concept of, you know, life does come to an end, but it also rebirths new life after that. That's kind of the centerpiece for a lot of communities, um, I guess, relationship with being alive. And so that obviously 
is significant if you want to have like a healthy healthy frame of mind and a healthy interaction with oneself and one's community and the land surrounding it. Um, and then economically too, I mean, think about all the tourism dollars in Alaska. Think about all the tourism dollars on the West Coast to see wildlife. Um, subsistence fishermen that are filling their freezers with fish every year, literally to feed their families all year. Um, the commercial fishing industry, we can talk about that if you want, but uh, there's a highly productive commercial fishery in Bristol Bay in Alaska, and every year they're seeing 50 to 60 million sockeye salmon alone make it past the fishing fleet. So wow. obviously there's still, wow. yeah. No, there's, there's, there's no downside to a prolific and abundant amount of, of salmon. Right. It, there's upsides everywhere for it. That. I've never put it in those words, and that's, I mean, that's exactly, there's no down, there's literally no downside to having no, salmon everywhere. There's no. upsides spread everywhere. Every There's an upside for everyone and every species to abundant salmon. Yeah, definitely. And I feel like we could talk about this for a long time. For a time. long time. And yeah, I think, I would, no, 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 great. I would love to have you back on, like, throughout this project, because I'm really excited to see where this is going. Um, I think it's really going to impact a lot of people. Um, but tell me how, how can people that are listening here, how can they reach out? How can they support you? Uh, how can they learn more? And what's, what's the name of, of yeah. your project? Sure. That would have been useful to mention <laughs> earlier. Um, so it is a, I'm the, I, I'm arguably the world's worst pun master or whatever those little jokes are, dad jokes or whatever. Oh, we like puns, Con- dad jokes. Yeah, com- clever little combinations of words, but it is a play off of words, generational amnesia and salmon. Uh, so we're calling it Samnesia, which is spelled S-A-L-M-N-E-S-I-A, Samnesia. And that's the website right there, samnesia.com. And we're on Facebook as well. Um, I think we'll get on Instagram. I think Lee's going to take care of that. One social medium is enough for me, but I think he's pretty savvy <laughs> at those things. Yeah. And uh, we're also trying to, I mean, obviously we're trying to raise money to do this because we can't travel and film for free. And uh, we want to do it completely grassroots. We've already had a couple people from a couple corporations that are pretty active on the West Coast offer corporate funding for it. And we actually declined because we don't want any strings attached, usually with big donations from any entities that have um I guess, uh, PR strategies, public relations strategies, any donations coming from an entity like that are going to have strings attached and you can't actually tell the truth that you want to tell because you're going to have to mold it to fit what they want you to say. And so we've declined some, some pretty big funding already because we want to be able to just tell the story. We don't want to have to soften it or dilute it here and there. And so, uh, we do have a little bit of a GoFundMe campaign going. You can find us on there at just search Samnesia at GoFundMe. Uh, but if you want to just read up a little bit more, find out a way to contact us, um, just find us on our website, samnesia.com. Great. And we'll link that in the show notes too. So you guys can find that. But, um, I, I really think this is going to be a great project. It's going to be one that, you know, is important to support. So uh, if anybody out there is looking for a nice, nice way to support a, a good project that'll benefit salmon, benefit bears, benefit southern resident killer whales. And and like Jeff said, there's no no downsides. It's and all benefit upside. people. And people. Um, in a big way. Like in, yeah. a, like in in ways that we don't really even fully want to talk about, you know, like in deeper ways, like not just with fish in your freezer or not just with uh, a paycheck if you're a commercial fisherman, but like those deep, profound resonant ways that help you feel like you're participating in this biological world like you're an active participant in this shot at life that you have and that's actually a lot more important than I think we give credit to if you feel like you're participating on this planet and the more life that's around you um, the more you're engaging with it whether just observing it or maybe eating some of it or um using it as a tool or a conduit to help to help you relate to your own highs and lows in your personal life, deal with uh, maybe the next generation, deal with loss, those sorts of things. Those are really big things. And if that's a species or, you know, five different species that have served that role for a lot of people for a lot of years, 
and we're missing it right now, like just, you know, think about what would happen if we regain that. We'll definitely have you on again and uh, as, as the project unfolds so that we can uh, mm-hmm. keep our, our listeners uh, in tune with what you've got going on. Yeah, I really, yeah, I really want to have you back on. So, but uh, thanks for joining us on that part. And, and I know we usually talk about some recent sightings just to keep people kind of in the loop of what's going on. Um, so we've had some cool stuff going on. David, you've been out on the water for some of it. I know I've seen a couple things. I've been missing a lot as well. Uh, and Jeff's finally back from Cleveland. So uh, you've been seeing some cool stuff too. It's been incredible out there. And it's been so long since our last podcast that so much has happened. Um, yeah, I mean, I I will just jump into something from this just a few days ago. Um, we had a group of killer whales going into this inlet uh, called Sandwich Inlet. It is uh, across in, in British Columbia, not too far from San Juan Island. And it's the same area where Sarah uh, had her encounter with uh, Rizzo's dolphins uh, back in January. And it's this really beautiful, narrow inlet. Uh, I don't know exactly, how, roughly around 10 miles, uh, probably not even quite 10 miles down to the, to the bottom of it. Um, but it gets narrow. At some points, it's, it's less than a mile across. And it's, it's not uncommon for us to see big killer whales go all the way down to the bottom because there's, there's food along the way for them, but there's uh, some nice seal haul outs at the very bottom. Yeah, there's like a seal steakhouse down there, I think. Yeah, I think yeah. so too. Uh, we, were, uh, we were going down there uh, with a group of killer whales uh, a couple nights ago, and it was just – the weather was incredible. It was like there was – at one point, and I think this is only capable in the Pacific Northwest, we had f- fog – sun and rain all at the same time and uh got this incredible spy hop i've never seen anything like it um it was a fully open mouth spy hop and i'll, I'll post a picture in the show notes just showing off their pearly whites I've there. Just, I, yeah showing off pearl i've never seen anything like it without uh a trainer and a trained animal yeah yeah no it was a cool photo for sure and I think that was T100F? T100F, yes. Nice. Yeah, David and I were out on the water then. We had a morning trip. And of course, we're, I yeah, mean, we're all, that, we're all missing out something. Yeah, we, yeah. yeah no. that, that is it. Yeah, you're always like, yeah, you feel like whenever something's being seen and you're not seeing it, you're like, well, just my luck. The wh- <laughs> yeah, the, but the whales are out there on your day off. Yeah, I mean, that, that is how it works. <laughs> Well, speaking of um, Biggs killer whales in kind of unique places, uh, Jeff, you and I had uh, some killer whales go through Jorgensen Pass. Yes. And that was like a once in a lifetime. I actually never thought I'd ever see that in my lifetime, to be quite honest. It's this beautiful little pass between Maine Island and um, Saturna Island, and there's some other islands in there too. But, um, I mean, in parts of it, it's like, I don't know, maybe 60 feet wide. Well, I'd yeah, and at one point we had to stop and wait and give them the right of way because the, as you the channel where, yeah, always, they always have the right of way. The channel where we were going through with them, it wasn't wide enough for all of us. So it's like, hey, after you. Right. Yeah, and they um, had a few seal snacks in there. Oh, yeah. It was pretty cool, but it was in the rain and it was just kind of like that moody Pacific Northwest um, really cool encounter. So, but yeah. interesting, like that's an area we go through there all the time because it's a shortcut to get to areas where we see whales a lot. And never did I think we'd ever see them in there and go through there with them. And uh, somebody we were with put it really well. For as often as we go through there, I'll never go through there and look at that place that the place same, the way, same way. Absolutely. Yeah. And to help people visualize that pass, it's. Uh, It's just kind of tucked behind and in and amongst a few different hills. And so even on a sunny day, it's usually just kind of got some shadows in there and it just feels intimate. And at its most narrow, it's probably like three or four boat widths across. It's a really, really narrow place. It looks like a a small river that you'd find in like Montana. And there's a group of killer whales swimming through it. Great. Great description of that. Yeah, that yeah, is it's, great. It is. It does look like you're in a river system back there. 
And for those of us that have been on, or for those of you that have been on tours with us, if you've been through Jorgensen Pass and you don't quite remember where that is, if Jeff has pointed out the world's best hot tub, that's the pass. <laughs> the, the world's best hot tub is back there. I, it's not quite the best in my book because I can't use it, but we'll, we'll get there. I, 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 I have a dream of one day being able to, to take a soak in that hot tub. <laughs> one day. Um, well, I will mention this even though I'm a little bit bitter about it, but uh, Chainsaw has been in the area, guys, um, kind of in June this Chainsaw year, which is a little June. bit odd. I think everybody on the crew has seen him this year except myself. Um, not bitter at all about that. But, <laughs> well, it, yeah, Chainsaw been pretty cool seeing yeah, him Yeah, Chainsaw around. in June is not a typical thing. He's usually in April, April May. Yeah. Um, and we'll post a photo of Chainsaw in the in the show notes, and you'll understand why his name is Chainsaw. Though up in Alaska, do you know his name up in Alaska, David? No. Zorro. Oh, my. Okay. Yeah, he's called Zorro up in Alaska. So. Yeah, always, always exciting to see him. And uh, seen him just uh, some trips, just him and his mom, and, and other trips, him and his mom, and 15 to 20 other killer whales. Yeah, I and think we were just cruising around in the Strait of Juan de Fuca. We were actually getting into some pretty heavy seas and decided we were going to turn around after we'd already had a little bit of an encounter with, I think, some humpback whales, actually, if I remember right. And we just decided that, uh, you know, we'd, we'd let those seas build and let those humpback whales enjoy it and had turned around and we we're just kind of cruising back towards San Juan Island for a couple miles and out of nowhere – one lonely dorsal fin popped up about a mile in front of us, and it was Chainsaw just out there by himself in three-foot waves, just having a good, whatever it was, Thursday afternoon. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, he, he is always one of, one of the favorites to see. And we don't see him m- most of the year, so when he's down here, from he spends a, a lot of time up in Alaska, so when he is here, it is, even if he's the only one out there in three-footers, yeah. it's, it's a great trip. Yeah, you know, if he wants to spend some more time down here this year, that's just fine with me. We don't have an update from the on the saga that that we had talked about on on the last oh T thirty four A one T thirty four A one still out, out there presumably out there. with her cousin yeah first cousin we, we don't me. know but we will definitely update people once we know but we have a new saga <laughs> with sixty five A five yeah you want to talk a little bit about the adventures of, of T-65 A5 and, and the, the newest saga that we have going on here. So, yes, we're, um, you know, as we're seeing more of these big killer whales around, um, we're finding that some younger animals are leaving their moms, uh, T-34 A1 being a good one. David, actually, you and I were out there last year and saw her, and then the next day she was gone from her family unit. Um, but T-65 is A5 is another one. He's the fifth offspring of T-65A, born in 2014, so eight years old now. And just a few weeks ago was seen with mom um, and siblings and, and some whales from Alaska, the T-64Bs, and they had been down in Puget Sound for a few weeks. And then they came out, and I think all the fleet was with these these guys over the course of a day and then what the next morning we woke up to find that big news t65a was stuck in a lagoon in port angeles harbor so there's a mill in in port angeles harbor and he had like swam through a little canal into this lagoon and had spent the night in there so t65a5 was not t65a just to oh yeah yeah sorry t65a5 was the one that had swam into the lagoon um and we were wondering, you know, at first we were wondering who this whale was. And then, of course, it's like, <laughs> of course, it's, <laughs> of it's course, the it's T-65A5. Yeah. Um, he, you know, he's dispersed from his mom time to time. He s- seems to join back up and and then leave again. Um, and they called in a bunch of agencies, of course, to see how they could get this whale out of the lagoon. And it sounds like he just swam out on, of his own volition, oh, like right course. as soon as everybody, you know mobilized and gathered in Port Angeles he decided oh yeah no I've had enough of I've had enough of the lagoon and well left. I think he, he said oh the government's coming up with a plan I'm, I'm out of here <laughs> who called the cops <laughs> right who called the cops um so yeah he swam out of the lagoon and um actually has been seen with his family since then so like they reunited and he had a has a tale to tell I guess 
yet another tale to tell. Absolutely. And, and it hasn't just been uh, an epic spring and early summer with killer whales. Uh, humpbacks lately, th- this, this spring, have been epic. Well, Big Mama and her seventh, seventh kiddo come back and kind of stolen the show. Um, he's been practicing his flying lessons, I guess, quite a bit. So Big Mama is is probably the most iconic humpback. Well, is it not probably? Big Mama is. is definitely the most iconic celebrity humpback we have in the Salish Sea, and is given a lot of the credit for the humpback comeback uh, that we're seeing here. And she has brought back her seventh calf this this summer, and definitely has has stolen the show. And we're we're hoping uh, in one of our upcoming episodes, we're going to talk in detail about the humpback comeback that, that's going on here. But just just in the time that I've been out here, uh, it went from being pretty unusual and special to see humpbacks to we're seeing them just about every day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this new catalog just came out. Uh, Tasley Shaw, uh, Ocean Eco Ventures, um, and works with various research organizations, put a lot of time and effort into this. Mark Mallison as well did a lot of the photo uh, photo work. Um, but they just put out their new ID catalog just a few weeks ago. And I think 801 new, or not new, uh, 801 individuals identified in this new catalog, which is through almost 300 more than the last one just released a couple years ago. Well, and, and when I, my first season here in 2015... Uh, the catalog that I had on the boat was 100 humpbacks. That's amazing. Incredible. So I think we're going to have Tasley on to talk about the humpback whales and, and what she's seeing and all that. But, um, yeah, it's been just incredible. And to kind of tie that in, humpbacks, Tasley, salmon. Um, I was actually chatting with Tasley, what, two or three days ago about this. And, uh, you know, I was I just was asking her like what her thoughts were about um, kind of the general understanding around here that humpback whales were extirpated. It was a local extinction from these waters, and I don't know when the last one was seen around here, nineteen twenty something like that. Yeah, between maybe. nineteen ten and nineteen twenty, maybe. Yeah, I, think it was I, by I had always read they were gone. That's what I had always read was and, around nineteen. And so for for decades local residents regional residents just kind of just took that as reality like yeah the humpbacks were here they're no longer here and that's the way it is i guess it's one of those species that lives elsewhere but doesn't live here anymore and i just she and i were kind of going back and forth thinking like look at the catalog now more than 800 whales after having zero here for yeah 80 years like we think maybe it's not possible to help salmon come back to their native rivers, but we do have examples of pretty pretty impressive recoveries right in yeah, front of us. Yeah, well, that uh, it's a great point. We do have a lot in front of us, just it, just out our back door here with bald eagles, uh, peregrine falcons, stellar sea lions, stellar sea lions, harbor Humpback seals. Whales. We see a lot of success stories out on the water. Um, and if we can do this for salmon, the southern resident killer whales would would follow suit and also be a success story. And so much more, I think that like there are probably people that know, you know, have that connection to other other things that would be affected, but that we've lost that knowledge that you were talking about, David. And, like there are things that will be affected in a positive way that we can't even un- you know fathom at this point. Like we just don't even know at this point. We're we're out of our element. Yeah. <laughs> We've grown up with that shifting baseline, and we just don't know it's it's there anymore. But um, you know, the potential is is huge, and we don't even know it. Yeah one one last note that I have on recent sightings and tying tying this back That's to an salmon important one. is, and I missed this. I was in. They showed up the day I left for Cleveland. And they left the day I got back from Cleveland, <laughs> but uh, J-Pod was here. J-Pod was here, and they were doing their West Side Shuffle. It was it was pretty special. Um, you know, even when they're here in the summer, we don't we ha- I haven't really seen it a whole lot. 
Um, lately, they're making a lot of for- forays up to the Fraser River, usually when they're here. But this time, um, they did go up to the Fraser, but it was usually pretty quick turnarounds. They'd go up and start coming back down the same day. And they spent several days just off the west side of San Juan Island. And I remember thinking every night, like, this is going to be the night that they're gone. I'm not going to see them the next morning. And then the next morning, they're, they're still there. And they just did the shuffle. They're, they're kind of like what I was familiar with when I was coming out here in the 1990s. And the whales were here, you know, in the summer. And, and then there were like 60, you know, trawlers out there. And they were weaving through the nets. Kind of, again, that shifting baseline, like... Um, it was it was a, a flashback almost. It felt like I was kind of living in the past there for a little bit. That's amazing. Yeah, and and it is a, a shifting baseline and and shifting knowledge because I don't really. We talked about this in episode one. I don't really know those those days. For for me, southern resident visits here uh, have pretty much always been been rare because of the the lack of salmon. Yeah. Yep. Nope. But they were yeah here for for. I don't want to say quite a while, but how long were they here? It, well, it was around was it, two weeks because that's how long. Ten I was, days, yeah, two that's how long. Ten I was, days, I want to say something like that. That's how long I was gone. It was, it was like, it, I mean, I knew exactly when they were going to leave. I knew they were going to leave the <laughs> day I got back. <laughs> but yeah, no, they, you know, were in here. They were extremely social. Dave, and you got out to the west side and saw them a bit. Yeah, I had a uh, had a day off of work, and so. Went down to look for whales on my day off of work. And I spent, I don't know what I spent, probably 10 hours on the west side of San Juan Island. Um, Got out there in the morning, and it it was just quiet, and all you could hear were just a few little birds chirping here and there, some uh, sparrows of some kind, bald eagle up in the distance a little bit, really bright and early in the morning, and uh, just swimming back and forth right off the west side. And I was in this little cove, kind of surrounded by like this natural amphitheater of rocks that allowed that any kind of sound coming off the water to really just resonate in there. And so the whales were, I don't know, maybe a quarter mile offshore, but it sounded like they were 30 feet offshore. Wow. Yeah. It's amazing. It's, it's one of my favorite things. Like, of course I love working on the boats and, and being out there on the water with these guys, but um, seeing Jay pot or any of the Southern residents from shore, doing that it's just it's it's magic it's magic so but i'm happy to share some photos and video that i got from that in the show notes as well and um yeah it's just been a really cool cool bit and i'm looking forward to sharing more settings with everybody in yeah, the future episodes absolutely we're gonna keep everybody updated and and hopefully you guys can some of you can come out here and and we can take you out on the water to see this for yourself um, you can get more information about us and access the show notes at afterthebreachpodcast.com. Uh, follow us on Instagram at afterthebreach. And you can email us at uh, afterthebreachpodcast at gmail.com. Yeah. And I think uh, it's been a few weeks, admittedly, that I asked for viewer questions on on Instagram uh, we are going to get to those, and that, in fact, a couple of them are perfect for Tasley on our next episode. But definitely send in any of your questions you have, any any ideas that you have you'd like to hear about. Um, and if you have any questions for Davin, uh, we're happy to to follow up on that too. So, um, yeah, thanks so much for joining us, Davin. It was really great having you on on the podcast. Hopefully, it was uh, fun enough for you to join us again. Sure. Yeah. 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 It's uh, it's getting really late now. It's like ten o'clock. On <laughs> so Saturday we're all night. like <laughs> dreaming of bed. Um, but just one, you know, just revisiting one more thing. Um, this is a project that that we're taking pretty seriously. It's something that I've been thinking about pretty much every day of my life for the last fifteen years. And then have really started to refine it and understand uh, some of the things that need to be conveyed that haven't really been conveyed yet to a broad audience. And so we want to take it seriously and we don't want to do it half-heartedly. And so if we, if we do take it seriously, we are the realities is one that we're, we're going to need to raise some funds to do it, to be able to pay for some time in the editing room to have some tra- for some travels. And uh, if this is something that's of interest to you and you're interested in contributing, great. Um, you can find us on GoFundMe. Just search Samnesia, S-A-L-M-N-E-S-I-A. 
And if not, no worries, no worries at all. Just if it's something that you feel is also important and you have some kind of a connection to or want to learn more and want to help in whatever ways you can, because we view this as not just like our story, just myself and our, my project partner, not just, um, Maya's legacy whale watching, not just San Juan Island, but really everybody up and down the West coast. It's like, it's a story about us as people that live out West. And if you want to, if you want to be part of that story, um, shoot us an email. Our contact is on our website. If you want to support, uh, I've already mentioned how you can do that. And if you want to learn more, just reach out. Yeah. And I would say, you know, with anything like too, if you guys want to donate, great. Um, but share it, like share the Facebook page, share the website with friends and family, like, uh, the broader you can spread this and get people, you know, just at least thinking about it. Uh, it can do a lot. Yeah. Really good point. We, I mean, we've just really gotten up and running in the last couple of weeks. And so on Facebook, we have like a hundred followers and we're hoping that will grow of course, but we're, we're brand new on that, uh, medium. And really one of the things that inspired me to start this uh, with my friends Sarah and Jeff here as well um, is just knowing how big our reach is, how many people already are interested in this part of the continent, how many people are invested in southern resident killer whales or marine ecology broadly, and then looking at our social media pages. I mean, gosh, I think I don't know how many people you reach individually, Sarah and Jeff, and how many we reach as a as a company. And so eventually we'd like to have that big broad reach around uh, the region, maybe even a little bit further afield. But if you jump on our Facebook page and say, Oh, these guys have a hundred likes. These guys are amateurs. We're just getting started. (laughs) Just getting started. Yeah. Well, we will post links to your Facebook page and to your website uh, on after the breach podcast.com in in the show notes. And uh, if you've enjoyed listening to any of our episodes, uh, share share it with your friends, uh, follow us, and we're looking forward to many more podcasts ahead, including with, with David and uh, our next podcast about the humpback comeback in the Salish Sea. Yeah, thanks everybody uh, for joining us wherever you are, and we'll catch you next time.